Hello, and welcome to episode 77 of Design Curious Podcast. I'm your host and mentor, Rebecca Ward. Today on the podcast, we'll be talking about finish selections. So this is definitely interior design 101, because this is something you're going to want to do for every single project, whether it is commercial, residential, or otherwise. Now, before we get into that, please do check out the show notes like I remind you every week. We also often include links to other relevant podcasts and other great things that you're going to check out, like the downloads of the three things I wish I had known before I started my career in interior design, or even the design quiz to see what kind of interior design you should be doing. So go and check that out. All you have to do if you're listening to this on your device is scroll down in the episode and the show notes are down below, but you can also go to my website and click on podcasts and you'll see the latest episodes as well as back episodes and get the links for everything and you can listen to it right there on my website. Okay, so let's get into finish selections. You're now listening to Design Curious, a place where you, creative one, are here to learn about what it really is like to be an interior designer. And I'm your host and mentor, Rebecca Ward. If you're worried about how to succeed in a creative career, if you're ready to learn your next steps to become an interior designer, and if you want the satisfaction of doing something you love every day, you are in the right place. Grab a coffee, a notebook, and let's dig into today's episode. Going back to when I was in college for interior design, I remember having projects where we were required to go to our sample library that we had on campus and select finishes for the project. These are often fabric books and surfaces and samples that were donated from designers that were maybe not in circulation anymore. So we were able to use those. But I remember feeling completely lost and unsure about what was the right thing to select for this and how to go about it. But they certainly didn't give us any direction on how to do it or any feedback. It would have been great, I think, instead of just sending us in there to pick what we thought looked good to actually work with a designer or with the instructor while we were selecting finishes. And so they could give us immediate feedback on like, yeah, that color is great, but that type of fabric is never going to work because that is for window coverings is not going to last as an upholstery fabric, things like that. So I think the real time feedback would have been most useful. And that's kind of what I try to do with my interns when they are in the office is give them real time feedback and try to give them some tasks to select finishes and or be at least present when we are selecting finishes for a project so they can understand and hear our reasonings, why we're selecting this over that and what comes together. But I definitely felt like I was just being thrown in the deep end and just grasping at straws to put some finishes together that I thought would work. Usually what we do when we get started on a project selecting finishes, we'll start looking at the things that we selected as a preliminary reference while we were in the consultation with the client. So usually at our initial consultation, we'll bring a bag of more generic or if we know kind of the style that they're in, some samples of tile, some flooring. Of course, we'll have our paint deck with us and countertops. And we'll look at things that the client might like. They'll say like, oh, yeah, I kind of like this shape, but not this color or I like glass tiles. I like marble tiles. I like wood flooring over laminate or tile flooring and different things like that. So we'll get feedback while we're in person with the client. And then once we're ready to start actually selecting the finishes for the client, we'll either consider something that maybe they're like, oh, this is the countertop I've been looking for. And this is definitely something I want to use in my project. So we might take that actual sample that we had at the consultation and start building around that. So oftentimes there's a floor or there's a countertop that we're looking at or looking for something similar to that. And that's kind of where we start in our selections. Oftentimes it's a floor or a color of a floor. So we'll start selecting flooring. We'll put that out on the table and we'll grab our countertop. And so often we've been doing quartz. That's kind of our go-to standard. Of course, with all of the silicosis discussion going around. 
clients and myself might be more open to going back to more natural materials. Of course, there is more maintenance, and so people need to consider that as well. But as far as I know, all of the fabricators in my area have said that they use great practices for cutting quartz and that the silicosis is not as much of a concern for their employees. So we'll see about that. But for now, we almost always do quartz as the countertop. So we'll select a couple of those, bring those out. We'll start pulling out all of the tile samples we have in our office for backsplashes or for the tile floors. Oftentimes we'll look for if it's in a floor, we want a porcelain tile because it's the most durable. So for the most part, we will consider porcelain tiles, but a lot of the more handmade looked or the hand glazed look, those are going to be ceramic. And so we'll do ceramic for like backsplashes and things like that, where you're not going to drop something against it. It's just there to look beautiful. We're also considering grout colors at this time. We also will look for the baseboard style. So sometimes in the bathrooms, we might do a tile baseboard or a marble base, but then sometimes we want to have a wood base, depending on how large the bathroom is or how wet we think that baseboard area is going to get, or this even just the client style. So if they're doing a lot of marble in the bathroom, we might want a marble baseboard, uh, but it's usually individual tiles that are about like eight inches long, and it's definitely going to cost about 10 times more than it would an MDF baseboard. So we look at that. If we're going to put crown molding in there, we select a style, we select the size of it, we'll write that down. And this is all getting put into a spreadsheet, finished schedule that we can keep track of and make notations on. And this is what we're going to be handing to the contractor to do his bidding off of so he can see what finishes we're actually using, get costs, breakout and everything like that. And it's also what we're going to reference as they're doing the remodel to make sure that they're putting in the right tile and that it's in the right direction and everything like that. The other things that we might want to consider while we're selecting finishes is, so all the surfaces, but also, you know, if you're doing the countertops, there's going to be an edge detail for that. So are you using a 2CM or 3CM countertop so that it, countertops usually come in centimeters? So 2CM is pretty standard. And often at the edge, they will laminate an edge to make it thicker because 2CM is, oh, it's about like a half inch or more. And 3CM is closer to more of an inch. And so sometimes you can do a 3CM without having any laminated edge and you just finish off that edge. So you have a thicker countertop on top. So you have to make sure that the cabinets are a little bit shorter to allow for that counter to finish at the height that you want it to be. So typically in kitchens, we'll have 36 inch countertop height. Now this can be adjusted depending on your clients. If you have clients that are over six feet, then you're, you might want to have a 37, 38 inch countertop height to customize it for them. So it makes it their job a little bit easier and same in the bathroom. So bathroom countertop heights, often for primary bath, we'll do 36 inches. Secondary, because often kids are in there, we'll do 34 inches sometimes, or we'll keep it at 36 because they can just use a step stool. And then as they grow and become adults, using that bathroom, they might want to add 36 as well. You'll notice as you go into older houses that the standard used to be 32 inches high for the bathroom vanities, which if you're 6'5", leaning over to wash your face or something like that, that's just a long way to go to wash your face. So we Typically now we'll do it at 36, but every designer might have different standards that they use. And so some might always do 34 inches in the bathroom or 35 or whatever it is, um, custom detail that is one that that designer has found most the majority of their clients like, or they might just tailor it for that specific client. So besides the surfaces, you also want to consider the walls. So definitely have paint colors that were throwing into the mix. So you want to consider if there's going to be paint, wall covering, if you're going to do a specialty finish on it, like a Venetian plaster, you might do some wainscoting so, or some wood paneling just to break up a, a large blank wall. And, you know, other trim pieces that might be some uh, chair rail or picture molding or something like that. So depending on the style of the client, you're going to want to add a little bit of detail there. So you're going to select those 
styles and that can all be found in like a trim catalog and you're going to pick out which look that you want if we want it clean looking or if you want a lot of detail on that and so we'll pull out wallpaper samples and consider any accent walls we might want and then the wood finishes for the cabinets as well so there's a huge range you want painted cabinets you want wood cabinets is there going to be a glaze if there, what's the door style what's the hardware on the door then you also want to consider the window sills in the bathroom and the kitchen. Are those going to be wood? Are they going to have an apron? Are they going to be, is the countertop material going to go into the windowsill if it's at the same height? Often something that we have to double check is that if we're doing a tile backsplash in a kitchen and there's a window in front of the sink, we will often tile into that window. However, if we want an inside mount shade, then that tile is going to get in the way of the shade closing all the way if we're tiling into the window. So we have to make sure we're considering all those things. We either have to have the shade made so that it's allowing for the tile, so there's going to be a little bit of space at the top, or we stop the tile at the edge and have some pretty edge detail and then have the shade, or we do an outside mount shade. So all the things to consider. If you're not overwhelmed already, but you can see why the homeowners need a designer to keep track of all of this. There's a million balls up in the air that we are juggling and details we're thinking about. And we're not just taking, you know, the kitchen all by itself and just looking at what the kitchen looks good. And then we need to go and look at the bathroom and have a completely different design. We're looking at the whole house all together because you want it to be cohesive. You want a flow from the front door to the back door, from upstairs, downstairs, to everything feel like it had intention and design. And that's why they're hiring you as a professional. So take your time selecting finishes. You might have a whole day selecting finishes because you want it to be right in the right budget. You want it to be the right durability, the right finish. You want to make sure that, you know, shower floors aren't slippery or the floors in front of the slider to the back door where they have a pool, people walking in and out. You want to make sure that the water on that floor is going to be okay. So there's so many things to consider here that take your time, take a day, two or three or revisit it to make sure that you get it right because these details matter. The finishes, you know, stay with the house. If they move, the finishes stay there. So you want it to look good for a long time and you don't want to make any mistakes. And so all the time that you spend up front working out all of those details are worth their weight in gold because you don't want to be like, oh, I'll figure out the grout color once they start installing the tile. No, you need to get this all <laughs> in place now so that if it's a special grout color, then you order ahead of time that you won that's going to make that tile really pop. Then you need to know. They need to know so they have enough lead time. So winging it is never the right approach as a designer. You want to have a systematic method to selecting your finishes. And so oftentimes we go through a checklist of all the things we need to include in the finish specs for each project. Even though the requirements are different, we want to make sure we don't miss anything. Another key thing about this process is that you're going to want to reach out to your reps likely to make sure that the product that you're selecting can be used in the fashion that you want to use it for. It might be like a metal in a mosaic that you might want to put in the shower. Well, you want to make sure that's okay. And oftentimes they will discourage putting metal in wet spaces because of rusting and things like, or the rust might seep into the grout or like run down the wall or things like that. So a rep can definitely tell you the pros and cons of a product and help you to be certain about what you're selecting and that it is going to work for your client and for your space there. So oftentimes we'll start with all of the hard finishes first, and then we'll move into the softer finishes like window coverings and bench cushions and things like that. But you might even get down to details of the floor registers or vent covers or, you know, things like that. Uh, closet doors, uh, transition strips, and there's a million billion details. Honestly, I don't want you to get discouraged. I actually think it's fun. I like it edit as a challenge to make sure I capture all the details I could possibly consider before even stepping into the space that's been demoed. So 
I hope that you are able to see that as well and are not discouraged by the amount of detail that needs to go. I am naturally not a very detailed person, but I love this kind of detail. I love figuring out all the the details that are going to make a subconscious difference. You might look at a tiled shower and think, oh, it's beautiful. But are you noticing like the edge trim piece that's going around or the grout color? It's all working together to be beautiful. But you might not very consciously be noticing all of those details, but the designer will. But I love having all those subtle things that really might not get noticed consciously, but are definitely making a difference subconsciously to everyone who sees it. The other thing you might want to consider on the materials you're using is the sustainability of the products that you're selecting. So it might be more of a challenge to find sustainable products, but that might also be something that is going to help you sell your design to the client to help them know how sustainable this project actually is going to be, how healthy the environment and the air quality is going to be once they use these materials over other materials. So above all, make sure that you're designing for the client's requirements. You've figured that out first before you get to the finished selection phase. I know the finished selection is really the fun part. That's where we're really designing the look of the home. But you want to make sure you're doing your diligence before and making sure all of the client's requirements are set in place, whether that is for mobility, for health concerns, the type of family they have, just their activities in the home. And so make sure that's being considered, and then you will be designing a much better space for them. So it's no wonder that homeowners can get quite overwhelmed when they need to go and select finishes for their house because it is hard to see the big picture. And that's what they're paying us to do is like bring it all together, make it cohesive, and not get distracted by the shiny thing that doesn't fit with their project, but is still beautiful. (laughs) So you can't have all of the things all together. There needs to be intention around the design and the, the finishes that are being selected. So that's where the professional comes in. And that's why you're important to the project. So I hope you enjoyed that. Leave me a review and let me know if you like this episode or what your favorite episode is. I'd love to hear from you. That's it for this week. Stay tuned and we'll have another great episode next week. And until then, stay creative. Thanks for listening. If you love this episode, please leave a rating and a review. This helps me reach other curious creatives like you. If you have a topic request or would like to contact me, simply head over to my website, rwarddesign.com or email me at podcast at rwarddesign.com.